you had a uh, wonderful Rosh Hashanah. Although, uh, a little black humor, although maybe it's not humor. I remember somebody went over to a Hasidic Rebbe, kind of a very serious Hasidic Rebbe, and said, uh, was Rosh Hashanah nice or good? So he said, I won't know till next Rosh Hashanah, but okay. Yes, <laughs> Hashem, we hope that it was a beautiful uh, Yom Tov. You know, when my, uh, when my son uh, was in second grade, my son lives in Baltimore, and Hashem, he's married and has his own children. But when he was in second grade, I uh, came home uh, Friday uh, before Yom Kippur. And we asked him, as we always ask him, do you have any homework? Homework. So he said, oh, easy assignment. The teacher just said, do tshuva. And, uh, <laughs> so the thing was that uh, Hashem, for, uh, for a second grader, it might be an easy assignment. Uh, for us, uh, it's really the most difficult assignment of all uh, to do tshuva. And uh, once again, um, I talk so much about tshuva that I can't really give another talk about it. And I'm not going to give another talk about it now, but I just want to make the very, very essential point that I've said many, many times, so if you've heard it a million times, please forgive me, but it's a very important thing for people to hear, and that is uh, tshuva should not generate within us depression, unhappiness, sadness. It shouldn't be, oh, I am so bad, I've done so many things that are no good, because you see, even if it's true, and I mean, it's not always true, we we're, better, we're better than we think we are, but even if it's true, you know, it really doesn't help to be negative about yourself. Because when you get negative about yourself, what happens is you get depressed, you get sad, and that is not the thing that energizes you, and that is not the thing that's going to bring you to a better place. The goal of tshuva, thinking about the past, is, is, is the goal is not the past, the goal is the future. So really, you have to think about what is the best type of situation to make me a better person as I move forward. And if thinking about the past is going to have the opposite effect, then you don't think about the past. You really deal with the future. Every moment is a new moment. The whole idea of tshuva is that you're not bound by your past. You're able to escape it. You're, uh, you're able to be different. What you are today is not what you were yesterday, and what you'll be tomorrow doesn't have to be what you are today. So I say this because I say that, that you, know, in, you know, we talk about tshuva, we take it seriously, we introspect, we look into our faults, we look into our flaws. But depression is not the, is not the right modality. It really is. You have to have a sense of simcha, that Hashem is giving us a great opportunity. And uh, if thoughts will lead you into the depression, then you should pull away. Pull away, even if that means you're not doing what you think is the perfect tshuva. The truth is, sometimes the best tshuva is not to dwell on the past and to move forward. Now, when you're strong enough and secure enough, then you can look at your past, just like in the Alcoholics, uh, the 12-step program. Uh, there is a point in which you make amends and you try to fix the damage that you've done, but, but you've got to be strong first. You have to be someone who will, who will not be broken by that type of, of confrontation. Now, there is one other thing that one has to know, though, and that is the very important rule that I'm sure uh, you've spoken about with, with everybody, and that is uh, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, only brings an atonement uh, with repentance, with tshuva, for the sins that I commit to Hashem, but for the uh, hurts that I inflict on other people, uh, Yom Kippur does not give you forgiveness unless you seek the forgiveness of the other person in a very, very sincere way. Sincere, meaning it's not the pro forma, I'm walking by you in the hall. Are you mocking me? You know, I'm not even <laughs> waiting, you know. Uh, but if, you know, I guess most of the time, you know, most of the time the little things that no, didn't really bother a person, you know, you don't even have to ask Mechila so much. It's not like you have to be crazy about this. But if there's something serious, you know, you try to make amends. So uh, there is a very, very interesting uh, machlokas, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter and the Chavitz Chaim. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter uh, died uh, I think in the 1880s, the 1890s, and the Chavitz Chaim was a relatively young man. Uh, and the Chavitz Chaim wrote his book on Lashon Hara, which was the first book he wrote anonymously. That's why he called Chavitz Chaim, because the, the verse, based on the verse in Tehillim, who is the person who loves life, he who guards his tongue from evil. So he just called it Chavitz Chaim, and he didn't put his name on the, on the book. But Rabbi Soslanter read the book of Chavitz Chaim, and he said, Baruch Hashem, Hashem has provided uh, a gadol for Am Yisrael, for the new generation. And he really, really loved the idea 
that the Chavitz Chaim uh, gave us the laws of Lashon Hara, what you're allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say. People were taking it very lightly. They weren't paying attention to it. Uh, but it's brought down, there was one halacha in the Sefer Chavitz Chaim that Rav Yisrael Salantar disagreed with, and he said it was incorrect. And that is, the Chavitz Chaim rules that if I speak Lashon Hara about you, that is a sin not only between man and God, that is a sin between man and man. So if I want to do tshuva on my Lashon Hara, I have to go to you and tell you what I said and ask your forgiveness. If I don't ask your forgiveness, the halacha is I don't get forgiven. This is what the Chavitz Chaim rules. Now the truth of the matter is, uh, they, they have another story about uh, doing tshuva on Lashon Hara. How do you do tshuva on Lashon Hara? A man went to the Chavitz Chaim and said, how do I do tshuva on Lashon Hara? So the Chavitz Chaim says, oh, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Take a pillowcase and stuff it with all the feathers. They used to, you know, in those days, they used to stuff it with goose feather, feathers. He said, yes, yes. He thought it was some segula. The guy thought, yep. What I so, Go on the roof on a windy day. Yes, sounds great. <laughs> Shake the pillowcase and all the feathers fly. Says, oh, yes, yes. What else? What do I do after that? Oh, one more step. Go and gather all the feathers and put them back into the pillowcase. And that's how you do tshuva for Lashon Hara. Now, let me, which means it's so difficult. Uh, and, you know, in a way, the fact that Lashon Hara is even when it's true, that makes it harder to do tshuva. Because if, God forbid, I said something false about you. So I could say, even then, it doesn't work that well, but at least I could say, I lied, I was wrong. What if I said something about you that's 100% true? So how do I retract it? I'm sorry I said, I'm sorry I said uh, that true thing about you. you know, what are you supposed to do? So in a way, it's harder to do tshuva on true Lashon Hara than it is on what's called motzi shemra. Motzi shemra is lying, slander, defamation. And even then, though, even on the false thing, you know, we, we have this in the newspaper all the time. You know, the, uh, the headline defaming somebody is on page one, and the retraction is on page 52 in, in small, uh, small print that nobody ever gets to. Now, remember that the Chavitz Chaim lived before there was an internet, and he was talking about a small little town uh, today when uh, any defamation, any slander, any Lashon Hara can be spread worldwide at the click of a mouse or the push of a key, you know, the devastating impact of Lashon Hara is much, much more powerful than it ever was in the history of the world. And, you know, you can't take this lightly. Uh, you know, there are pe you know, people uh, have committed suicide if they've been outed. Okay, wh whatever, they're getting into the, the particulars of that. But uh, the Lashon Hara that gets spread in the internet has, has taken lives, has destroyed lives in a very, very real sense. In the courts, you know, secularly, there's a whole discussion, uh, are you liable? Meaning, if you post something that causes somebody to commit suicide, uh, can you be criminally liable as an accessory to uh, uh, manslaughter? Okay, that's a whole big shaila. But certainly, in terms of God's book, uh, yeah, you know, you're kind of an accessory to murder under those, under those circumstances. Uh, so it's very hard to do tshuva. But still, the Chavitz Chaim says, you have to go to the person and ask their forgiveness. Now, when I go to a person and ask forgiveness, they're entitled to know what it is that I did to them. Right? If I go over to you and I say, please be mochel me for anything bad I did, you have the right to say, well, do you remember anything bad that you did? I need to understand it. So I go over to you and I say, please forgive me for the bad thing I did to you. And you say, well, what was it? He says, oh, you really don't want to know. You know, that's going to make you feel worse. Uh, and if I tell you, it's going to make you feel worse as well. So Rabbi Suhal Salanter actually ruled where asking a person's forgiveness is going to make them feel worse than had they not known, it is actually better not to ask them for forgiveness. And he argued with the Chavitz Chaim. The Chavitz Chaim said, you got to ask forgiveness. Rabbi Sosalantra says, what gives you the right to seek your forgiveness at the expense of causing more suffering in the process? Now, this would depend on this subject. For example, if the guy already knows that things have been spread, so, you know, he's already been hurt, so then you go over to him and you tell him, you know, I'm really, really sorry. But if he wouldn't know and it wouldn't come back to him, 
uh, Rabbi Saul Salantra takes the position, it's, it's often better not to say. And this is consistent with his general philosophy. There's a famous phrase that he, I don't know if he coins, but it's often said in his name, don't be a tzaddik on somebody else's cheshbon, on somebody else's inconvenience. You want to be a tzaddik. Uh, you want to get up uh, 2 o'clock in the morning to go to the base medrash, and that's great. But you need an alarm clock, you know. Uh, so you set it to ring loudly, waking up your roommates or whatever it is, he says. You know, that's not such a great mitzvah. You know, you want to be a tzaddik by inconveniencing other people, by hurting other people. Uh, you don't do that. In fact, uh, they tell, uh, again, there's so many stories about this. Uh, Rabbi Israel was so makbit not to do chumras, uh, that would not to do any even strict practices if it would inconvenience or hurt other people. Uh, the story goes that for a lot of his life he would travel from city to city to be Makariv people and the like. So one time he was at uh, the Shabbos table of a person who had been a Talmud of his in the past but who was now a wealthy merchant in Germany. And the person said, Rebbe, it would be such an honor for me if you could be at my Shabbos table. I have a beautiful Shabbos table, you know. Uh, we have uh, Zemiros and Torah between the courses and the Suda Friday night is four or five hours uh, and the like. And it's so, Baruch Hashem, but with the Rebbe there, it'll be so elevated. So Rizal Salantra said, I will be your guest on the condition that from Kiddush to the end of benching will be uh, under a half an hour. He says, and that's it. So, you know, it's pretty hard to do that. I mean, there were a lot of people in that, you know, so they, they made Kiddush and they washed and they ate. And, 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 I mean, no Zemiris, no Torah, no nothing. They went from, uh, from the beginning of Kiddush or Shalom Aleichem to the end of benching, a half an hour. The Talmud was really very, very disappointed. He wanted Shabbos to be a very special meal and this was like nothing. So Rizal Salander says to him, could you call in the cook? I want to thank the cook. So the cook was a woman. He was a rich guy, so we had like help. So the cook comes out, a Jewish woman, and he says, or Rizal says to her, I want to apologize for rushing you so much. I know that you know, I was very fast tonight. I hope it wasn't too inconvenient. She said, Rebbe, this was the greatest Friday night I ever had. You know, I'm a widow, and I have a 12-year-old son who eats, I eat the meal with. And I never leave this house before 1 o'clock in the morning. And my son is waiting for me. And then we make kiddush. And we're all so tired. And I spend like 15, 10 minutes with him. And that's it. And this is the first time in whatever it is, five years since my husband died, that I'm able to really eat with my son and enjoy his company. And we can spend time with each other. I said, Hashem should bless you. So I was also on there, looked at his Talmud and said, you know, you may have had a beautiful Shabbos table. But that was at the expense of keeping this widow away from her son for many, many hours. You were being a tzaddik by really giving her pain. And you have to make a cheshbon. What's more important? So this was B'derech Klal, his shita in life in many, many uh, areas. And that includes the issue of asking, asking mechila. So this comes up a lot. I mean, I get the question, for example, with bro bro broken shiduchim or things that were done years ago. And uh, it's not an easy question how to apply it, but, but you do have to ask yourself, and this is what, what you have to analyze, and that is, would I be causing more pain by bringing it out? Now, the question is, okay, so Machlokas, Rav Yisrael, and the, and the Chavetz Chaim, so who do we paskin like? Right? Who do we paskin like? So obviously, I'm not, I'm not in a position to tell you who we passing like between the Chavis Chaim and Rav Yisrael but they say in the name of Rav Aaron Cutler, a very important idea, that when it comes to Musar and Ben Adam Lechavero, between man and man, Rav Yisrael is considered to be the definitive posek, even over the, the Chavis Chaim. So I think it's safe to say that we actually do follow Rav Yisrael under these uh, circumstances. Yeah. So if you... Um, uh, pardon me, was, was this mine? I don't remember. Yes, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If you. If you did wrong to Sarah, and there is certain things he knows, and there are certain things he doesn't know, and it, those things that he knows are things that you, you consider appropriate to uh, ask for uh, forgiveness. Yeah. Uh, and the other ones, you think it's not appropriate to ask for, for forgiveness, even if he's entitled to know. Yeah. Should, uh, if, if you don't tell him and you just tell him, can you forgive me for all the evil deeds, like, can you consider to not hurt him? 
Solentia. Yeah, I, I think according to Rabbi Solentia, that would be a, an appropriate thing. Uh, and uh, but, but he then says that even if you can't ask forgiveness at all because things would come out, he says Hashem will put into his, if you're, if you're really sincere, Hashem will put into his heart to forgive you. It says even if you don't know. In fact, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of pro- I mean, there are a lot of problems with this because sometimes we don't know the person that we may have hurt. We may have hurt people and we don't even know who they are. We don't know where they are, we don't know who they are. Uh, sometimes people come and talk to me about shoplifting when they were young. <laughs> they, they stole stuff, right? Uh, they don't know who they, you know, it's, it's amazing. How often, how often uh, this, I hear this. Uh, people stole stuff, you know, they, not just from stores, they stole stuff from uh, neighbors, from people. Uh, some of them even were quasi-professional, I mean, lucky they didn't get, get arrested, but they were quasi-professional breaking into houses type stuff. Uh, sometimes that happens, uh, you know, not recommended uh, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, they don't even know, you know, who it is and what it is and where it is, you know. So uh, it, it's, it's a little difficult. But there are times, listen, you do the best that you can with the knowledge that you have. And then you understand that uh, Hashem will forgive you for what you're not able to do as long as you try to do what you can. Yeah. yeah. Could you um, apologize to someone when they know you did something wrong to them, but it was, but they might have but telling them might remind them again? Yes, yeah, so, so, so again, it would depend. It would depend on whether it would make them very upset or they would welcome the reconciliation. And, and now, again, even there, you have to be careful there because if something will make somebody upset for a minute, but in the course of talking, you know, that could bring them to a good place, then you should ask their forgiveness. I don't mean to say if they'll be upset at all, right. but I'm talking about if the pain is like an open wound, you're reopening a wound that's really going to eat them up. So these are subtle, right? In other words, I, I can say the words here, but how you apply it in a given situation is not an easy question at all. You may have to talk to, uh, to a rabbi or, or a friend about, about this to be sure that you're not just looking for shortcuts. Because we have a Yitzhahara, right? Once what I told you now can be used as a, a cop-out. You know, I never have that smechilo because it's going to hurt the person and I don't want to hurt the person. You, know, you, know, you, you have to go through this. Uh, and uh, there's this famous story about the stipler, which is a fascinating story. Uh, the stipler, uh, Rav Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky, uh, well, today, we, we would call him Rav Chaim Kanievsky's father. When I was growing up, Rav Chaim Kanievsky was the stipler's son. I mean, the stipler himself was a great, great gadol who died, I think it was in the uh, maybe 70s. Uh, and his son was Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Uh, so uh, the stipler himself married the Chazenish's sister. That's why the, the Chazenish is Rav Chaim Kineski's uncle from that. Uh, in fact, I just dig- I digress, but I guess it's good to talk a little bit about this. Uh, the stipler, Horna stipler was simply the city in the Ukraine from which he came from. So Horna stipler, in short, is stipler. Uh, stipler. So he's the stipler, the Horna stipler. So the story goes that the Chazenish uh, became aware of Rav ya- Yisrael ya- Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky as a very chashava Ben Torah, so he made the shidduch with his sister Miriam. Right? The Chazanish himself made the shidduch with Rav Chaim Kinevsky. So the story goes that after Rav Chaim Kinevsky, I'm sorry, not Rav Chaim, uh, the stipler, Rav Yaakov Yisrael Kinevsky met Miriam, so uh, the Chazanish asked his sister how the, how the date went, how the pagisha went. <laughs> so she kind of shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, he sat down and he fell asleep at the table. You know, So... So the Chazanish, you know, called him in and gave him some very stark muster. He says, you know, this is not, you know, this is not <laughs> how, you, how you treat your prospective wife. And, you know, you have to have Derek Harris. And, what do you mean? You fall asleep while she was boring you? What is, he says he feels so bad. But what happened was <laughs> he was going on a train. And, you know, the trains in Europe used to be, I think they still are in some places, very fancy, very ornate. So there are classes, just like you have in airlines. There's coach, there's uh, business class, first class. So I, I had a ticket on coach, which just had wooden benches. But it was overcrowded, so they bumped me to whatever they call first class. First class had upholstery, fancy upholstery. But then I thought to myself, the upholstery might be wool and linen. It might be shotness. I'm not allowed to sit down on upholstery. I could sit on a wooden bench, but I can't sit down on upholstery that might be shotness. That's the halacha, right? You can't sit down on it. 
So as a result, I had to stand for the entire train ride, which was something like 30 hours, I think, believe the story goes. So I stood for 30 hours. I couldn't sleep. So, you know, when I finally sit down on a chair, my body just falls apart. I just fall asleep because I was up for 30 hours because of shatness or something. Actually, I'm not sure. Okay, I, I, okay, I, actually, I, I don't think the trip was 30 hours. I don't know if there's... I think what happened was he was planning on sleeping for the six hours on the train. So he stayed up 30 hours learning. That, that was the issue. Uh -huh. He figured I'll have six good hours to sleep, so I'll uh -huh. learn for 30 hours. What happened was he learned for 30 hours, and then he had to stand for six hours. Yeah, it wasn't the actual train ride, 30 hours. He wasn't coming from Siberia. Um, so this is the... Anyway... Um, why did I want to bring up the stifler? Oh, so here's the story with the stifler. So the stifler, you see, you see he was a big year from him. So let's go back, you know, let's go fast forward 60 years. He's an old man. And there's a bar mitzvah in B'nai Brak. And all of a sudden, the stifler comes in and he could barely walk. And he walked three miles from his house. And he goes into the shul. And, you know, they didn't invite him because they didn't know him and they didn't expect him to come. But all of a sudden, the Gadol Hador walks in. And everybody is like frozen. He walks up to the boy. He says like a sentence to the boy. And the boy nods his head. And then the stipler laboriously turns around and hobbles back another three miles to go home. So nobody knows what's going on. So they go over to the boy and they say, what happened? What happened? So the boy says, well, four years ago, when Zadie was alive, their grandfather, his grandfather was alive, we were davening in the same shul as the stipler in Bnei Brak. And Zadie couldn't see very well, so Zadie had a gigantic machzer like the size of a Gomorrah. And I was carrying the machzer to Zadie, and the stipler saw me, and he thought it was a Gomorrah, and he said to me, this is not the time to learn, now is the time to daven. And I showed him it was a machzer, and the stipler said, ay, 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 I hurt your feelings, I embarrassed you. I have to ask your machila, but you're a katan. A katan cannot give machila. Wow. So tell me when your bar mitzvah is. Wow. It was four years later. <laughs> so the stipler made a mental note of when the bar mitzvah was. Four years later, he shows up. He asks the child for machila, and then he goes back to the Brak. So that's a, a very interesting musr, that the pain that you give to a katan can be worse than the pain that you give to a gadol. Because I give you pain, I could ask your forgiveness, you could be mochel me. The pain I give to a katan, a katan doesn't have a koach to be mochel. So well, this is a little ahead, you're not quite there yet in life, but uh, this is an interesting quandary for a parent. So I'm a parent. So every time I do so, right, parents have to do a lot of things that the kids uh, don't like, right? Am I worried that every time I tell my child, my kid he has to do his homework or he can't go out or he can't do this and that? Have I committed some Avera for which I have an unforgivable Yom Kippur because I can't ask Mechila? So the, the answer is like this. The answer is, well, listen, if this is a legitimate chinuch, if this is a legitimate need to educate your child in the right way, and that includes some discipline, then you've done nothing wrong. The fact that the kid doesn't like it, okay, kids don't like it. You know, I, I didn't like it, you didn't like it. You know, none of us like it. But sometimes we need that discipline, we need that guidance. But that does mean anything beyond what is necessary for the good chinuch of a child, just because it's your kid does not give you free license to abuse. I mean, maybe abuse is a strong word because of the modern connotation, but uh, you know, you can't, we, we cannot stop and yell at our kids because we had a bad day in the office. They are people, and they also have the same right as any other person, not to be hurt, not to be humiliated, not to be embarrassed, not to be shamed. Right? We sometimes don't think of children in that way, but they too have those, that same zuchut. And if I am pogeya, in their zuchut, I have committed a sin for which I need mechila. So my point is, if it's legitimate discipline, then that's fine. That's what a parent is supposed to do. What's the balance? That's a very difficult issue. Uh, 
um, there's a <coughs> wonderful uh, from psychologist in Toronto who's a very well-known author. She writes columns in Mishpacha magazine. Her name is uh, Sarah Khanna Radcliffe. Very, very excellent. She has a number of books that if you're looking for a book on Jewish psychology issues, <coughs> she's a good, a good person to go to. Very practical, very lemaisa <coughs> on relationships and the like. She has what's called the 80-20 rule, which is very hard to follow. She says 80% of your interactions with your children are supposed to be positive. 80%. Keep the negative no more than 20%. And the thing is, if the negative is kept at 20%, it'll then be absorbed. It'll be accepted. If there's too much negative, if we sometimes have the opposite ratio, instead of an 80-20, we have a 20-80, <laughs> or, or maybe you know 10-90, uh, in which it's overwhelmingly positive, and uh, I'm sorry, overwhelmingly negative, then what happens is the kid uh, tunes out. I mean, if I hear negative, 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 I, st I stop listening. It doesn't mean anything to me, and I don't pay attention anymore, right? So she says we really have to strive to kind of be very, again, when you become parents, you'll take this uh, into account, overwhelmingly positive, positive. And this is what Chazal say in a very, very famous mimer. And that is, Yamin Mikareves Usmo Docha. Yamin Mikareves means the right hand draws near. I'm sorry, the right hand draws near and the left hand pushes away. With apologies to lefties, Chazal used the right hand as the symbol for the stronger hand. So the stronger hand means the dominant emotion. The dominant emotion should be drawing near, and the discipline of pushing away has to be there. It does have to be there. You can't just have everything goes, but the discipline should be the subordinate aspect of the relationship. Yamin mikarevet usmo docha. I think they say in the name of the guy, Rev Simcha Wasserman, it was, again, a name that maybe you haven't heard of. Uh, many of you have heard of the great Rav Ochanan Wasserman, who was the Talmud of the Chafetz Chaim and a great Rosh Hashiva in Europe, one of the Gedolei Hador uh, before the Holocaust, who died tragically in the Holocaust. Uh, he died in the Kovna Geta. We even have his last words, where he was exhorting everyone to, we're like a korban for Hashem, for Klal Yisrael, and we should have, our thoughts have to be pure. Rabbi Hanan Wasserman was an extremely serious person. In fact, uh, the Talmudim would even record the occasions that he smiled. It was like a special thing when he smiled, like on Purim or something, you know, like very, very serious. But he had one son who survived the war, and the son's name was Simcha, Simcha Wasserman. And when Simcha Wasserman came to America, uh, he became a Rosh Hashiv. In fact, he had taught in Ar Samech for a while. He was a Rosh Hashiv in Ar Samech way before my time, but uh, he, was, you know, one of the, he was one of the gedolim in his own right. And although he was obviously a son of his father, but he was also different than his father. His name, he was Simcha, like, like his name was Simcha. Very Lebedek, very vet. And he once said, Chazal's measure is such a beautiful metaphor, was it? The right hand uh, draws near, and the left hand pushes. So he says, Look at this as a real picture. Imagine you have a hostile person who's turning away from you. He's turning away from God. He's turning away from the Torah. And you put your two hands on his shoulder. And with the right, you pull him. And with the left, you push him. What do you get? Turn a turnaround. That's how you turn him around. That's <laughs> exactly right. It's quite literal. You turn him around. The right pulls him towards you, and the left pushes him, you have a 180 degree turnaround. And that's how you reach people. So uh, it's something to, 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 to think about in terms of the fact that we have to have covered for our children as well, for our children as, as well. And, you know, even in our Sameach, uh, you know, many, many times, well, not many times, but more than once, uh, Students, uh, as a result of a harsh word, as a result of a criticism that was not said in the right way, they get hurt. They might leave Yiddishkeit. They could be catastrophic repercussions when you don't have the kindness and the understanding. By the way, again, forgive me for, for digressing from uh, story to story, but um, I didn't get to my topic yet. Okay. Uh, 
uh, maybe I'll have one minute to, to actually cover the topic I wanted to cover. But uh, Rav Simcha Wasserman and his Rebetzin did not have any children. They did not have any children. And when he died, the Rebetzin said that she really didn't, there was no one to say Kaddish for him. There was no one to sit Shiva for him. She was the only one who would sit Shiva. When he died, she said, I really have no desire to live without my husband. I want to go with him. But there has to be somebody who will sit Shiva for such a great man. So she sat Shiva for him. And I think, I don't know exactly for sure, it was like a day or two or very, very shortly after Shiva, she died. So it was like mind over matter. And Hashem agreed to Tzadekis. She like willed herself. She, you know, she, she basically would have died with him. She willed herself to stay alive for Shiva, to give him that honor. And then she kind of just let go, and, uh, sh and she died. But somebody once wrote me a letter. Um, again, it was actually a letter of Musra. It was a, a woman that was criticizing me for something, and she was comparing something I did that may not have been so good uh, to Rav Simcha Wasserman. Okay, well, listen, I mean, most of us would, would fail by comparison. But she said... She always knew about Rav Simcha Wasserman that if the whole world had forgotten the Torah by watching him live his life, we would be able to reconstruct the whole Torah just by watching him for a day. He says he would have taught us the Torah not by even what he teaches, by just but the way the way that that he lived. Right. So it's a, a very very great uh, man again. Uh, a son of a great father, a son of a great father in all ways, but a very different personality, right? Rav Hanan was so, 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 so serious. And Rav Simcha was like full of uh, humor and, and joking all the time and the like. You know, Rav Hanan Wasserman was in the United States on a fundraising uh, tour in 1938. And when Hitler was making sounds about invading Poland and the like, which was really the beginning of, of World War II in earnest, uh, Rabbi Hanan was offered, was offered opportunities to stay in the United States as a Rosh Hashiva, and he could have stayed here. He could have stayed here. Uh, he went back. He said he would not abandon. He, he knew what was coming. He knew a Holocaust was coming. Uh, but he would not abandon his yeshiva. So he went back, and of course uh, he was uh, murdered together with uh, most of his Talmidim. And there's a very haunting picture of him uh, on the boat going back to Poland, going back to Europe in 1939, in which he's gazing, he's gazing into the ocean, the Atlantic. And, you know, every time I look at that picture, I always have a sense he knows, he knows he's going to his death, but he knows that this is his responsibility not to abandon, the captain of the ship, exactly right, that he was not going to abandon his Talmudim at the time of that time of that danger. And as I indicated, we do have some eyewitnesses who survived the Kovna ghetto, and they actually say, Rabbi Hanan was very calm as they were going to be led to be shot. And he talked about the idea that if we were chosen to be a kapara for Am Yisrael, we have to be pure in our thoughts. In fact, this was something in a different place, in Kelam, not, not in, but, but a very similar thing in which these Sadiqim went to their death in total calmness and acceptance. They weren't crying, they weren't hysterical. They just understood that this was part of their service at this moment. They lived for God and now they die for God and they accept it. You should know that this was such a powerful thing that even the Nazis got discombobulated. The Nazis didn't know how to handle it. The Nazis expected shouting, begging for mercy, you know, hysteria. They kind of enjoyed when people fell apart. That was part of their, they also wanted to inflict psychological humiliation. So they say in Kelem, this was not Rabbi Hanan, but a similar incident, when the Nazi, uh, whoever it was, the captain, ordered these Jews to be shot, and the Jews were just preparing themselves like Yom Kippur, uh, saying to Hillim, praying, and the like. And even the Rishoyim, you know, they said to the they said to the captain, I mean, 
do we really have to do this? They had like one minute, one second, where even they were overwhelmed. Of course, they were able to conquer their Yetzer Tov and, <laughs> and do what they did, you know, superhuman. But you can see that Kedusha can sometimes be so palpable. Kedusha can be so real that even the biggest Russia can't help but feel it. And it like pushes them away like a force field. I mean, it's, it's, it was, to me, that was always the most interesting, or I can use the word, part of the story, that, that even the Nazi like hesitated. He says, I, I really, I really can't, can't do this. There was something there. Because after all, I mean, how, how, did, how, how does the typical Nazi get roped into killing Jews? Uh, Jews are subhuman, Jews are materialistic, Jews are selfish, Jews are paris. I mean, I mean, in other words, the only way you could do this job, God forbid, is by convincing yourself that the Jews are not really human. <laughs> that, that was the rhetoric. They're vermin in the shape of a human body. And that was the psychological dynamic that allowed a Nazi to do what he did. But then you see how that's not true. <laughs> you see holiness. And at that point, the whole foundation of your evil is taken away from you. What, what do you do at that point? So to me, it was so amazing. It, Mamish overwhelmed them and, and the like. Okay, so now let me just, okay. So uh, this was a digression, but again, it's, uh, all of these are uh, in Yonim that we think about. Remember on Yom Kippur itself, in the Musaf, we're going to read about the death of the righteous. We're going to read about the ten martyrs. So the truth of the matter is, one of the things we recount on Yom Kippur is the death of the tzaddikim, starting from Nadav and Avil, when the, day the Mishkan was dedicated. That's in the Torah reading, Acharemos, and then the Asara Haruge Malchus. So to think about the Rebbe Hanan and the Holocaust is not really out of topic in terms of the, the various things we think about on Yom Kippur. But I do want to mention one, uh, one uh, little thought. You know, uh, the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur does everything. It's quite amazing. Uh, you almost get the impression when you read the Mishnah in Maseches Yuma, which is not mainly about the laws of Yom Kippur. It's mainly about the temple service on Yom Kippur. Seven out of eight prakim, seven out of eight, are about the service in the Beis HaMikdash. Only one parak, the last parak, are the laws of the fast of Yom Kippur. That's why most of Yuma is Kodshim, is about Korbanos, not about the laws of the fast. But on Yom Kippur itself, the Kohen, thank you, the Kohen Gadol does everything from beginning to night. No other Kohanim do anything on Yom Kippur. And you get the impression from the Mishnayas that Yom Kippur for everybody else was almost a spectator day. People just stood around and watched this guy running back and forth, going crazy, uh, morning to night. And we're, you know, we're not eating, granted, but we're just kind of, you know, watching him, you know, go back and forth and, and, and the like. But, you know, the Kohen Gadol goes into the Kodesh HaKadoshim four times on Yom Kippur. There are four times. One time for incense, one time with the blood of a bull, one time with the blood of a cow, uh, of a goat, right? So it's incense, a bull, goat. He sprinkles it in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And the fourth time, he just goes in to retrieve the empty incense bowl that he had left. He makes a special trip. The Bali Musr say, by the way, you see that cleaning up after your mess is a holy service <laughs> because uh, the last time he goes in, he makes a special trip into the Holy of Holies not to bring a korban, just to remove the leftover stuff. Now, he could have done that the last time he brought a korban in there. He could have taken out the thing. The answer is, the Torah wanted to be madgish, the Torah wanted to emphasize that cleaning up after your mess in a holy place is a holy service. So cleaning up in the base medrash or whatever it is, something to be aware of. Now, the Kohen Gadol also kind of kept on changing uniforms over and over and over again because he had two different uniforms. The uniform he wore during the year with the breastplate and the jewels, that had gold, golden threads in it golden threads in it. On Yom Kippur, he wore that uniform too, but only when he was doing service outside of the Holy of Holies. So he was constantly, like, like the Korban Tamid, the daily offering, things like that. So he was constantly changing garments. He put on his gold and brought the Korban Tamid. Then he put on white linen without gold into the Holy of Holies. Then he went back to gold. Then he went back to white. 
In other words, everything in the Holy of Holies had to be done with pure white linen. He could not wear his golden garments. So the question is, why can't he wear his regular uniform when he goes into the Kodesh HaKadoshim? So the Gemara says, because since gold is reminiscent of the sin of the golden calf, and when he goes into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Kohen Gadol is begging for mercy, Ein Kategor, that means the prosecutor that knows your sins, cannot be your defense attorney. Ein Kategor Nasa Sanegar, and therefore we don't bring in gold in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. So the question is, all of Yom Kippur were asking Hashem's forgiveness. So how come the Kohen Gadol does wear gold on Yom Kippur when he's not in the Holy of Holies? In other words, if the law would have been on Yom Kippur, he doesn't wear gold at all, so that would be fine. Ain't kateg or nasaner. But he wears gold a lot of the day on Yom Kippur. So why are you only applying it when he's in the Kodesh HaKadoshim? So one of the Svarim says a beautiful answer. He says, it's true that when the Kohen Gadol is asking for mercy, he shouldn't bring up sins of Israel. But that's when he's in the Kodesh HaKadoshim when nobody else is there. But when he's doing things that other people see, maybe they should be reminded. Not, not, you don't want to remind Hashem. I don't mean remind Hashem, but you don't want to bring up to Hashem your Averus. But when other people see, I'm not bringing it up so Hashem should see it. I'm bringing it up so they should be aware of it and do tshuva. Meaning there's a big difference. When you're just praying to Hashem, you only want mercy for B'nai Israel. Don't bring up their sins. Hashem knows their sins. It's not your business to bring up sins. But when you're addressing the people, they need to know sometimes what's wrong. Let them see the goal. Let them think of the chayda. They say this with the Satmar Rebbe. Somebody once asked the Satmar Rebbe. Now the Satmar Rebbe was very critical about a lot of things. He was against Zionism. He was against Aguda. He was against, uh, I, I don't mean non, he was against what most of religious Jews were doing. He felt they weren't strict enough, they weren't conscientious enough, uh, they were too lenient on dealing with non-religious people. He was, he was tough in a lot of ways. So somebody once asked him, he said, you know, it's a big chutzpah to ask you the question this way. He says, you know, Avram Avinu prayed to Hashem even for the evil people of Sodom, the worst, most degenerate, biggest Rishayim in the world. And Avram Avinu didn't write them off because they're bad. So you, the Rebbe, you're critical of Jews who keep Shabbos and who keep Kashrus because you think they're not 100%? Are they worse than the people of Sodom and Amorah? that Avram Avinu prayed for? What's going on? So the Satma Rebbe said, Avram Avinu was talking to God. When you talk to God, you only ask for mercy. You don't bring up people's flaws. You don't bring up people's faults. I'm giving Musr to people who need to hear Musr, who can correct themselves. And then he said, and how do you know what I say to Hashem when I'm davening? Which means... The Rebbe is saying, when you talk to Hashem, you don't bring up, oh, this person has this fault, this person has that. Hashem knows the faults. Your job is rachamim, forgiveness, compassion. But sometimes in our human interactions, whether you're a Rebbe, a parent, a teacher, in a nice way, in a positive way, in the 80-20 ratio that we talked about, sometimes you've got to bring up you know, the problems. You can't just let everything everything go. And that's the chiluk in the gold between the gold and the white on the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. Okay, wish you all a Gemar Chasimatova, wonderful Yom Kippur, and may uh, our tshuva be complete, but may it also be a very joyous, joyous tshuva. Amen.